Adam. Welcome back from lunch. Come on in, everybody. Have a seat. Uh, so I'm excited to be here and share the story of Ecological Reserve Monitoring in Maine. Like a lot of great forest science projects, it's really been happening kind of under the radar for the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, but uh, glad to be here and give it a little bit more, of it, more exposure. So um, here's what I'm going to cover. I'll talk a little bit about the history and background of ecological reserves in Maine, what they are. Um, I will talk about uh, the methods of monitoring, give uh, some in initial results, and a few key surprises from our monitoring efforts. Uh, I'll talk about the potential for using our ecological reserves data for climate change studies, and then wrap up with some challenges and next steps. Uh, I like this picture because this reminds me that I was once actually a field biologist. Um, and I have to say that this is a very cool project that we're creating a lot of really good uh, scientific data and I think we have a lot of potential for additional data come out to come out of it. But for me, personally, the best part of this project was being able to get to travel to and explore some of the most ecologically interesting and, and remote places in Maine. Uh, they really are some special places. So um, ecological reserves were designated uh, by the state about 20 years ago, close to 20 years ago, and there were a couple reasons cited in the state legislation for establishing them. A few of them had to do with habitat, uh, to protect habitat for species whose habitat needs are not uh, met on other lands. <laughs> Roughly 95% of the state of Maine is, is open to managed forest land. Uh, only about 4% or so is, is actually in reserve or off-limit status, and there are a handful of species that uh, prefer those, uh, those older forests. Um, and maintaining ecosystems in a natural condition and range of variation. So basically establishing large landscape scale areas where uh, natural ecosystem processes can occur. But in addition to that, uh, the legislature had the foresight to identify these as, as uh, reasons for ecological reserves as well, establishing them as benchmarks against which change could be measured and as sites for uh, ongoing research and education. Uh, and so there are a number of us who were involved in the, the designation of reserves who said we really need to act on that latter part of, of the, uh, the designations, the latter functions of the designations. And there actually have been times in the last five years where there has been some political pushback on ecological reserves where uh, the state government could actually justify their value in terms of long-term research uh, and education. So here's a snapshot of what ecological reserves look like currently in Maine. Uh, there are roughly 50 sites combined between state-owned lands and nature conservancy lands. Uh, and they cover about 175,000 acres. Uh, the sites range from anywhere from a couple hundred acres to our largest is uh, close to 40,000 acres south of Baxter State Park. Uh, they, do uh, 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 they do encompass some of the most uh, distinctive and unique habitats from coastal headlands, extensive peatlands, uh, alpine areas, uh, lake shores and river shores, uh, and extensive areas of, of matrix forest land. Uh, and I think what makes them uh, particularly suitable for climate change studies is they go uh, from sea level to over 4,000 feet in altitude and they cover more than 300 miles uh, of latitude from Mount Agamenicus down in southernmost Maine all the way up to uh, the northern part of Aroostook County. <clears throat> we formed a team to develop a long-term monitoring plan about 15 years ago, which had a couple different goals. First and foremost, we wanted to compare and contrast reserves with uh, the vast acreage of managed, managed forests in, in Maine, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those results. And secondly, we wanted to be able to measure change over time. So we're revisiting these plots on a uh, decade basis every 10 years, and we plan to do that for the foreseeable future. We're also looking at multiple scales of monitoring, uh, landscape scales through remote mapping. Uh, the stand scale is primarily what I'm going to talk about today, the results of our stand level mapping. Uh, and we're also monitoring rare plant species on the reserves as well. For any of you who have had any involvement with uh, U.S. Forest Service inventory and analysis plots, FIA plots, that's basically what we used as a, as a modified FIA plot sampling scheme. And we now have more than 1,000 permanent plots from ecological reserves, and we've uh, remeasured 600 out of those 1,000. So we have a pretty 
uh, robust data set now of initial results. All right, key findings. Um, it doesn't take a uh, forest ecologist with a PhD to recognize that ecological reserves, uh, not surprisingly, are quite a bit older uh, than our managed forest land, but we've been able to quantify that. Um, so this is age class distribution, and the yellow is ecological reserves. Uh, the gray is statewide managed forest land, so you can see uh, very distinct different uh, age structures, uh, and, and in fact, uh, for ecological reserves, we have, oh, I don't know, probably close to 8% or over 160 years old, and there's virtually none of that in the managed forest lands in Maine. A um, couple more statistics for you. Ecological reserves contain roughly five times as much old forest uh, as Maine's working forest land. If Depending on how you define old forest, we went with over 100 years old uh, in this case. And then a couple other statistics. Uh, the average age of a canopy tree in Maine's ecological reserves is about 90. Uh, that within Maine's uh, managed forest is about 59-ish or so, pretty young. Uh, however, about 100 years ago, uh, the first forester for the Maine Forest Service, a guy named Austin Carey, uh, measured trees coming down the river drives from the St. John and the Allagash and the Penobscot River and he counted rings on over a thousand spruce trees. This is a hundred years ago, so these are spruce coming out of the north woods of Maine, and the average age of those spruce trees was 182. Uh, so the dominant age class back then was out here, so you can really see how much our age class has shifted uh, through management of, of Maine's uh, working forest. So along with that um, age comes a lot of really significant, important differences in forest structure. Uh, we looked at basal area, large and very large trees per acre, so 16 and 20 inches uh, or size trees, snags and large snags, uh, coarse woody debris and, and large coarse woody debris. I heard a, a good term for this recently. Some of you may have heard it. Necromass is the new coarse woody debris. So that's your, that's your new term for the day. Um, so very significant differences in forest structure between the ecological reserves and Maine's managed forest land. Why, are that, why is that important? Well, there are a number of wildlife species, as we know, things like uh, pileated woodpecker that like large and um, large old trees with cavities. In addition to wildlife species, there are a number of uh, things like mosses and lichens that uh, we don't know a whole lot about, but there are some indications that uh, there are some moss and lichen species that have a, a much stronger affinity for uh, older forest than managed forest land. Now, one of the uh, interesting things we wanted to do was compare uh, managed forest land with ecological reserves, but also compare those two categories of lands with big reed forest. And just see a show of hands of how many people have heard of big reed forest. Okay, great, about half of you have. It's, uh, and there are actually people in the room who know big reed forest a lot better than I do. But it's about 5,000 acres uh, in northern Maine, and, and it's essentially the closest thing we have to old growth. Uh, and what we can see is for, for just a couple of our metrics here, uh, very large trees per acre, large dead trees per acre, and coarse woody debris volume. Although our ecological reserves are in fact different than Maine's managed forest land, they're still a long way from what we think of as essentially our closest to the, the, what, what we know of as true old growth in Maine. So big reed forest, or true old growth, really is still very different. Our ecological reserves were designated uh, from lands that had largely been managed in the past, so they are in fact on a trajectory to becoming late successional and, and older forests, but they're clearly uh, a long way from being there. Um, a couple surprises. Uh, so downwood volume, over the course of our 10 years of monitoring, actually declined over a 10-year period. And that was a bit of a head-scratcher, and we were still not quite sure why that's the case. But our guess is that it has to do with cycles of spruce budworm. A lot of these ecological reserves are in northern Maine, where uh, there have been budworm outbreaks for the past century. Uh, the last serious budworm outbreak was in the 1970s and 80s, and so we think there was probably a, a pulse of, uh, of snags and then deadwood when we first started monitoring in the early 2000s that has since decayed and is no longer uh, present in a measurable, in a measurable way. Uh, so that was one surprise. Another kind of interesting surprise uh, 
uh, was that despite the fact that we had natural mortality on reserves that was almost twice the mortality on managed lands, and that in itself is not surprising, but nonetheless, the net growth rates uh, for reserves were, were pretty comparable to those on managed forest land. So much higher mortality uh, on the ecological reserves in these very structurally complex forests, um, but very similar growth rates. And that's, I, I think, simply a, a fact of, of we had a lot bigger trees. And for a given radial growth on any, in, any tree, a much bigger tree is going to produce a lot more wood uh, than a smaller tree. So, the, the finding here suggests that relatively older forests can actually have comparable growth rates uh, to younger managed forests, and I think that's a, a pretty significant finding. I do want to touch on the potential for climate change studies. Uh, we, we've just begun to scratch the surface with, with our in this, uh, initial data analysis, uh, but because we have over a thousand plots, they are permanent plots that are GPSed in. Uh, and as I mentioned, they cover a wide range of elevation and latitudinal gradients and physiographic settings, north sides of mountains, sides, side south of mountains, et cetera. Um, I think the plots themselves are really well set up to uh, look at the long-term effects of climate change on forests. Uh, Nick Fisichelli gave a talk this morning where he talked about seedlings, uh, in particular being pretty susceptible to climate change impacts. We are collecting in seed, seedling and sapling data, and we're also collecting uh, data on herbaceous plants, so things like invasives and species like mountain cranberry, which is a high elevation and coastal plant which may be uh, subject to climate change long term. And it's the herbaceous data is one of the things about our project that really is distinctly different than the FIA uh, protocol. Some of you know may know that FIA experimented with a few years of collecting uh, herbaceous data, but they haven't uh, followed through with it. And we do now have herbaceous data on over a thousand plots. Uh, Jay Wason, who is actually here at the conference, has uh, done some initial work on climate change, looking at uh, the Bigelow Ecological Reserve and, and looking at this concept of front theory. In other words, over time, is that uh, difference between hardwood forests and spruce fir, spruce fir forests um, moving upslope. And what he found was that it's actually a lot more complicated than that. Uh, with the spruce regeneration from uh, past harvest history, there are some places where actually spruce seems to be moving downslope uh, in mountain ranges in Maine. So we're just starting to understand the complexities uh, of things like that. Uh, so successes, challenges, and next steps. Just as this is my wrap-up slide here. We have over a thousand plots uh, sampled uh, on the combination of TNC and state lands, and 600 of them have now been remeasured. And we think that the results uh, allow for, they're robust statistically, we've shown that, and they allow for a better understanding of forest structure under natural conditions. I think for those of us who've been working in the forest sector for decades, there's, there's been this off and on paradigm about managing forests to replicate or simulate natural disturbances. And unless we're really studying how natural forests work, we won't fully be able to uh, quantify those processes. Challenges and next steps, uh, certainly carbon analyses. Um, we, I think we have the data to look at carbon, both uh, standing carbon and carbon sequestration abilities on ecological reserves. So that's something we're starting to think about. Uh, we're starting to look at LIDAR as a way to assess patterns of natural gap disturbance uh, over time in, in our ecological reserves. And then certainly one of the reasons I'm here is, is we're very interested in comparing our data on Maine ecological reserves with similar data, long-term monitoring data that's being collected across other jurisdictions. Uh, and to that end, uh, we have actually worked on uh, just publishing a data paper in the journal Ecology uh, which a lot of the metrics we've talked about are available. Um, and this is the citation for that for any who are uh, interested in learning more. And uh, I will wrap up there. I think we probably got time for a handful of questions. I'm getting a yes from Adam. Yes. Your uh, big read forest data would suggest like a 180 to maybe 250 natural distance between disturbance regimes, is that? And would the, that disturbance regime have historically been fire? And if it was, are you planning on reintroducing fire as a disturbance regime in the forest? 
It's, yeah, it's unlikely that, that we see fire as a significant disturbance in Big Reed. It's primarily northern hardwood and spruce fir. Um, definitely long terms, much, like, much likely more than a couple hundred years of disturbance. At the risk of um, hijacking the rest of the session, I am going to actually ask Charlie Cogbill if he wants. He's done a lot of work there on disturbance history of Big Reed. And if you want to give a quick answer to forest uh, disturbance regimes in Big Reed. There is virtually no charcoal in the forest soils at Big Reed. And that's 8,000 year history of lack of fire. If some of us were just talking about this at lunch, I think probably the the biggest disturbance, at least in the last several decades that we're seeing, is uh, beach bark disease. Uh, it's, a, it's a stand heavy in, in beach, and a lot of that beach is dying off, and so we're, we're analyzing what's coming back. In a lot of cases, it's just young beach. Um, but that's probably the biggest disturbance we're seeing at Big Bear. Yeah? Uh, have you, or anybody, done any uh, like soil sampling or soil, you know, use these sites for anything other than just above ground vegetation monitoring. Um, these seem like they'd be great sites for uh, soil study or temperature study, like putting in some long-term you know, climate recorders. Absolutely, yeah, and we have not done that. We've, we've just done basic um, surveys to determine soil types. Um, but uh, one of the things that we've been working on doing is just promoting the value of these as research sites overall within uh, not only the University of Maine, but other colleges in Maine and, and throughout the region. Uh, the challenge with a number of them is they're, they're pretty remote. They're hard to get to. Um, but uh, I think there's, there's a lot of potential in looking at, at soil and relationships to productivity and deposition and all sorts of stuff. Great Do you point. Have any contact with NRCS and their ecological site people? Yes, I do. Yeah, and um, I've actually given in Maine, the guy's name is Jamin, um, and I've given him all the GPS locations of, of our plots so that he can combine what they know about soils and ecological reserves to the vegetation data we have to uh, make that, uh, make an, to inform the development of ecological uh, systems, um, ecological sites. Yeah, Eric. It's so great to have those in Maine. Uh, what's the chance of uh, state, state of Maine Expanding That's a great question. Um, yeah, if you had asked me two months ago, I would have said um, the negative number. I mean, we, for the last eight years, so as you know, I used to work for the state and I work for the Nature Conservancy, and for the last eight years, uh, there has been pushback on ecological reserves, and it's been a battle at times just to keep them, um, keep them as they are. Uh, it's, however, Maine has had a recent election and there's been a dramatic turnover and a new governor. Um, so I think it's possible there may be some new designations in the, in the future. Um, hard to say, but definitely the outlook is different now than it was a couple months ago. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you.